in a top secret project, a band of bold engineers plots to build IBM's first personal computer. What we then had to do was persuade our bosses that it was okay to turn this over to a kid. And ends up designing a deal that transforms a scraggly college dropout into the world's richest man. Bill Gates sold IBM a product that he didn't own yet. It's the summer of 1980. On the campaign trail, Ronald Reagan embraces corporate America. Business is big, and no one is bigger than IBM, a colossal corporation officially known as International Business Machines. IBM was 425,000 employees. It was two-thirds of the profit and half the revenue of the computer industry for a very long time. For nearly a century, IBM has made its fortune designing and servicing room-sized computers for corporations. Now, amateur competitors across America have begun selling small household computers that actually fit on a desktop. Microcomputers, as they're called. In the summer of 1980, IBM was remarkably frustrated about the personal computer. It had tried two or three times in a very serious way to make a PC happen, and it seemed to be unable to do so. And IBM was embarrassed. Now, at a special projects facility in Boca Raton, Florida, a faction of IBM executives claims they have a solution. Until now, the company has produced every part of every machine it has ever sold. The engineers of a top secret plan codenamed Project Chess want to change all that. They suggest that IBM buck tradition and build a personal computer by using parts purchased from outside suppliers. The charge is led by a seasoned executive named Bill Lowe. For the first time, we were recommending that IBM uh, not be the sales arm, uh, not be the service arm, and that we would use hardware and software that was developed outside. IBM's top brass is skeptical. They hand down a mandate. Before they'll give him the green light, Bill Lowe has to track down all the parts he will need. To find some of the most critical components for the computer, Bill Lowe entrusts a senior member of his special projects unit named Jack Sams. He called a task force meeting on a Sunday, as I recall. Got 13 of us together and said, we've got 30 days to put a plan together to do everything that had to be done to develop and uh, test a complete system. But word on the street is that the best man to help Big Blue and Jack Sams get their computer parts isn't exactly corporate material. He is an unlikely 24-year-old college dropout. His name is Bill Gates. He had several enterprises in high school where he was programming to make money. He had rounded up kids to do work for him and you know, he sold their work at a profit because he was charging, paying them nothing and charging his customers more. Five years earlier, in 1975, Gates had created a software development company with a friend from junior high school named Paul Allen. They called their company Microsoft. Now, in 1980, the company has grown to about 30 employees, including marketing manager Mark Ursino. I was totally impressed with the fact that he could talk about anything that you could almost feel him listening to you and uh, analyzing what you were saying and, and assessing you, you know, whether, how do you match up in the, in the Bright's department. Another one of Microsoft's earliest employees is a former NASA computer engineer. Ten years older than his co-workers, he holds advanced degrees in mathematics and astrophysics. His name is Bob O'Rear. 35-year-old O'Rear had to acclimate quickly to Microsoft's relaxed environment. We wore whatever, uh, whether it was Bermuda shorts or workout, uh, nobody wore, wore a tie. It was extremely casual. Bunch of uh, young, single guys writing software, basically, like a fraternity. Bill Gates' frat house is in a Seattle suburb called Bellevue. He and his band work inside this bank building across from a strip mall. It's about as far away from corporate America as you can get. Our bookkeeper did books on the floor and bare feet and was keeping receipts and stuff and shoe boxes. Now, 51-year-old Jack Sams of IBM, the largest computer company on the planet, is about to place a call to Microsoft. He has been assigned to find two pieces of engineering software so IBM can build its dream machine. 
The first piece is the electronic language programmers use to communicate with the computer. The second piece is the brain of the computer or operating system. It's the engine that lets computer users perform basic tasks. July 21st, 1980. The morning after Sams gets his special assignment, he telephones Bill Gates to see if Big Blue can pay a visit. The phone call Jack Sams made it was one of the seminal moments in American corporate history. At that point, IBM had $26 billion in annual revenue, $3.6 billion in profit, and a, an enormous market value. Microsoft had nothing. July 22nd, Jack Sams and his entourage arrive at 10800 on the corner of 108th and 8th Street in Bellevue. They exit the elevator on the 8th floor and walk into suite 819. They ask for Bill Gates. Young fellow came out of the back hall and I said, come on back. And uh, I was looking for Mr. Gates when I got to the office. He went around to the back of the, went around the, back of the desk and sat down. I realized the young man I thought was the office boy was in fact Bill Gates. Sams has strict instructions to reveal as little as possible about IBM's computer plans. His real intention is to size up Gates and Microsoft. He was tense, very focused on what he was saying. It didn't make any difference to him. His necktie was a little crooked. Sams avoids discussing specifics of his project, but he gathers that Microsoft can supply its electronic language. It also sounds like Microsoft can act as a vendor for the operating system. Gates seems like IBM's man. What we then had to do was go back and persuade our bosses that it was OK to turn this over to a kid. August 6, 1980. 30 days have come and gone. Upon Jack Sam's recommendation, Bill Lowe pitches IBM higher-ups on the idea of creating a microcomputer using parts supplied by Microsoft and other suppliers. Everyone on the corporate management committee hates the project. Frank Carey, chairman of the board, is intrigued by the proposal. He gives Bill Lowe the go-ahead. Lowe, Sams, and Microsoft have one year to get a microcomputer built, tested, and into market. In those days, to get a product out the door in IBM with one year was, uh, uh, was really on the outer edge. If Lowe's team can pull this off, IBM can jumpstart a new computer market, reaping billions of dollars in profit. For Bill Gates, the job would be a dream come true. This is the one that could really change everything. What no one knows is that Bill Gates and his band can't do what IBM wants. In fact, the upgraded operating system that Sam's thinks Microsoft is pulling together doesn't even exist. August 21st, 1980, a global giant is on a crusade. One month after paying his first visit to a fledgling computer company, Jack Sam's flies back to Bellevue, Washington. Shortly after 9 a.m. on August 21st, 1980, Sam's arrives to meet 24-year-old Bill Gates and his management team. We laid out in detail what we were trying to do, uh, what, what the hardware was going to look like. We couldn't contain the energy. But the energy is quickly curbed by a major problem. Jack Sam's wants to buy two computer components from Microsoft. Gates says Sam's can have Microsoft's language software with no problem. But the second piece, the brain of the computer called the operating system, is much trickier. There's only one company, Gates suggests, that can provide it. Gates says his friend's company, Digital Research, near Monterey, California, is the only place that can produce IBM's upgraded operating system. Together, Gates and Digital Research's owner, Gary Kildall, can supply the parts IBM needs. Gates calls Kildall on the spot and arranges a meeting with IBM for the next day. As soon as the IBM folks left, Bill went absolutely nuts. We knew that a deal like that with IBM, if they got really serious about pushing their PC, uh, would totally revolutionize what the company looked like. August 22nd, Jack Sams drives south along California's Highway 1 to Pacific Grove to meet with the owners of Digital Research. In this quaint Victorian home, the IBM project hits a huge hurdle. Digital Research won't sign IBM's one-sided non-disclosure agreement without knowing what IBM wants. 
IBM basically said, I can use anything you can tell me. You can't use anything I tell you. By the way, this meeting never happened. Digital research refuses to cooperate, forcing the IBM team to leave empty-handed. A desperate Sam's calls Bill Gates. We assumed we could get this, and our assumption was wrong. If you don't have an operating system for this computer, it's pretty much dead. Without an operating system, Sam's tells Gates that Microsoft's deal with IBM is off. Two weeks later, Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen digs up a lead. Just a 30-minute drive from Microsoft in a suburb called Tukwila, a small computer retailer called Seattle Computer may have a crude homemade operating system. The manager of the shop is an amateur computer programmer named Rod Brock. The company was really run by two technical people, myself and Tim Patterson. Uh, both Tim and I were trying to act as business people, but really we were both technical people. Brock's head programmer, 25-year-old Tim Patterson, built the system in just four months. They called it the Quick and Dirty Operating System, or QDOS for short. QDOS runs like a scaled-back version of the operating system IBM needs. It would have to be significantly adapted, but using the framework could save months of labor. September 22, 1980. With a mandate for secrecy from IBM, Paul Allen calls Rod Brock and asks if he would ever consider licensing QDOS. Brock says he might let someone use it for about $10,000. Gates then went to the IBM folks and said, I can buy it, you can buy it. How do you want to handle this? We wanted third-party participation. We wanted third-party hardware people. We wanted third-party software people. Uh, we wanted the world to jump on our bandwagon. Gates says he'll try to get QDOS from Seattle Computer. A deal with IBM is once again within reach. The next step is to complete a large proposal for IBM with an official price bid, a schedule, and specifications for QDOS and the language software. It's the biggest proposal Microsoft has ever done, and it's due at a meeting in Boca Raton, Florida in just one week. The evening before the proposal is due, Bill Gates, office manager Steve Ballmer, and head programmer Bob O'Rear rush to finish the details of their IBM proposal. We finished that proposal and we just ripped it out of the word processor, uh, threw it in our uh, briefcase and headed for the airport. At Microsoft, it was kind of a game to see um, who could get to the airport just in time. You know, you, you, you know the, the winner was the guy who stepped on the airplane just as the door was closing. True to form, Gates, Balmer, and Bob O'Rear are the last ones to board Delta's nonstop overnight flight to Miami. September 30th, Gates, Steve Ballmer, and Bob O'Rear touch down in Miami about 7 a.m. Their meeting starts at 10 o'clock, but they have a two-hour drive ahead of them. Baggage claim, changing into rarely worn suits, and picking up the rental car mean every minute is critical in order to be on time at IBM. I changed into a suit, put on my tie, as did Steve. I can't even imagine what the reaction would be if somebody showed up without a necktie. Bill changed into the suit and discovered he didn't have a tie. These guys barely knew how to wear a necktie. Decided it was important enough that Bill should have a tie. And so we drove over to the shopping center and uh, went to the door, and it wasn't quite uh, 10 o'clock, so they weren't open. They were petrified because they had to have neckties. So we waited for them to open, dashed into this clothing store, and bought Bill a tie, and then quickly drove over to uh, IBM offices in Boca. The Microsoft crew arrives at the IBM offices about 10.20 a.m., 20 minutes late. We're sitting around waiting for them. They showed up breathless and uh, in full business attire. The IBM team lays out more research and their project deadlines. Gates soon realizes that he will have to wait until the next day to make a formal price bid on his work. And when he does, it won't be the plan that IBM expects. The next day, Bill Gates is prepared to make the pitch of a lifetime. Jack Sam's trying to be nice to Gates, pulled him aside and said, don't be afraid to ask for a lot of money. We know this is going to be more expensive than it, it probably should be. So if you want us to give a, a million dollars for this, we'll give you a million dollars for this. 
When Gates takes center stage to make his pitch, he surprises the IBM team. Gates doesn't want a million dollars. What he wants is simple, just $400,000 to license his electronic language software called BASIC. He'll even throw in the operating system QDOS at no extra charge. But he has one hook. Gates had the hard way learned a couple of lessons that turned out to be very important. One is that you never take a lump sum payment for something. Gates insists that he be able to sell his language software and Seattle Computer's operating software to other computer manufacturers. And he'll take a royalty, one dollar for every computer IBM sells. If it wants to do business with Gates, IBM has little choice but to accept his terms. After two days of meetings, Bill Gates emerges from Boca Raton with a verbal deal with the king of all computer companies. IBM paid little or nothing, but they had basically given Gates the right to print money by selling to lots of other companies. We were very jubilant over that uh, and uh, felt we, we had a grand opportunity. There's just one little detail Bill Gates has not addressed. Bill Gates, enterprising genius and programmer extraordinaire, has not actually signed a contract with Seattle Computer to use its operating system called QDOTS. Bill Gates actually sold IBM a product that he didn't own yet. And Rod Brock at Seattle Computer may not agree to the terms Microsoft wants. And I said, wait a minute, you changed it. You changed the deal we talked about. November 6, 1980, Bill Gates guarantees in writing that he will provide an operating system on a new microcomputer for IBM, the largest computer corporation in the world. But Gates has a problem. He doesn't actually own the operating system he promised. Microsoft still has to cut a deal with the owner of QDOS, a small computer shop called Seattle Computer. November 10. Microsoft's Paul Allen is assigned to hash out a deal with Rod Brock at Seattle Computer. As it is now, the companies have a gentleman's agreement. Brock will get a flat fee every time Gates enlists a manufacturer to build computers with QDOS installed. They're willing to pay us $10,000 for each one they signed up. And we visualized that very likely they might sell a dozen companies, uh, perhaps even more. Rod Brock still doesn't know who it is. We thought that was a bit odd, but uh, they came up with a uh, client and paid us $10,000, so we had our first sale. So we thought we were on our way. But before the deal is done, Bill Gates will attempt a radical ploy to change his contract with Seattle Computer. Meanwhile, in Bellevue, Washington, Microsoft programmer Bob O'Rear has a lengthy checklist of tasks in order to make the operating system run on a prototype microcomputer provided by IBM. They had to figure out some way to force fit it onto this machine from IBM. If the software doesn't work, then there's no deal. By late December, O'Rear is already falling behind schedule. It was a frantic pace. I basically was either sleeping or I was working on the IBM project. Crammed into a tiny room, O'Rear suffocates under a mountain of top secret paperwork, corporate formalities, and inflexible working conditions. It was a sauna in there, which not only made it very hard for the people working in there, very little could be accomplished, but actually did funny things to the machines. You're working on uh, software that's untested, trying to make it work on hardware that's untested. I was at my wits end. June 25th, 1981. IBM is less than eight weeks away from launching its first personal computer. While O'Rear frets, Gates is analyzing the computer market and thinking about his deal with Seattle Computer. As it is now, Gates has a non-exclusive agreement with Seattle Computer to license its quick and dirty operating system in exchange for $10,000 per customer. But thanks to Bob O'Rear, Microsoft has improved the software so much that Gates feels Microsoft should be the only vendor allowed to sell QDOS for Seattle Computer. They said that if we would give them the exclusive, they'd put more effort into selling it. Brock didn't see what was going on, which was that this was a deal with IBM. Over the next two weeks, Gates and his legal staff draw up a proposed agreement to license QDOS from its owner, Rod Brock. 
July 10th, with the IBM launch just weeks away, Microsoft sends Seattle Computer the proposed contract. When he sees it, Brock is blindsided by a surprise clause. Microsoft will be the sole owner of QDOS. Struck me as rather odd. I wonder why he wants to be a sale. We hadn't planned to sell anything. Microsoft office manager Steve Ballmer and Rod Brock meet to hash out the deal once and for all. Steve Ballmer said, we got to get this, sign, this contract signed. And I said, wait a minute, you changed it. You changed the deal we talked about. Ballmer claims that selling QDOS outright will help Brock, that Seattle Computer will be able to sell computers with the improved DOS, plus have unlimited access to future improvement at no charge. Perhaps most enticing, there's a cash incentive. Microsoft will give Brock $50,000 if he signs a deal now. And $50,000 at that time was pretty important to us. July 27. Banking on an immediate buck, Brock agrees to Microsoft's terms. Every scrap of the quick and dirty operating system now belongs to Bill Gates. One week later, Bob O'Rear successfully completes work on QDOS. Gates rechristens it Microsoft Disk Operating System, or MS-DOS. August 12, 1981. Just two weeks after Gates signed his deal for DOS, IBM launched its first personal computer. No one expected what happened next. Big Blue had only planned to sell 240,000 computers its first year. Customers clamored for more. A flood of competitors copied IBM's basic design and began selling PCs too. Since Bill Gates' deal with IBM allowed him to sell to anyone he wanted, essentially all of Big Blue's competitors bought language software and an operating system from Microsoft, making Gates a millionaire virtually overnight. While Bill Gates continues to reign supreme over the computer software industry, the strategy that put him in power offers three important insights into deal-making tactics. First, defend your future options. While no one anticipates the real demand for the PC, Big Blue weakens its position in the computer market by not negotiating an exclusive agreement for DOS. At the time, IBM wasn't thinking all that far ahead. The line around IBM was that you don't have big problems in small markets. And they assumed the PC was going to be a small market. Rod Brock of Seattle Computer loses his once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to cash in on DOS when he lets Bill Gates dictate terms that leave him out in the cold, revealing a second principle. Never undervalue your assets. They often thought that, gee, I should have tried to get an option for 1% of Microsoft stock. And I probably could have got it. Oh, I wish I'd been a bit smarter. One of the reasons I went back to the university is and got a business degree. Lastly, after appropriating DOS, Bill Gates doesn't stop there. He transforms the asset into one of the most lucrative products in the world, a course of action that illustrates lesson number three, exploit fate. What transpired not only reshaped the computer industry, but turned Bill Gates into the richest guy in the world and put IBM and Microsoft in a position where instead of having IBM have all the market value, Microsoft now has twice the market value that uh, IBM has. It, just, it, it was a, a turning point in corporate history. Microsoft's deal for DOS. It was a big deal that transformed a small startup company into a global powerhouse worth more than $200 billion. A big deal that changed forever the way we work, play, and communicate.